Why was the Protestant Reformation so focused on the truth that God justifies sinners through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone? Why were the Protestant reformers, Luther to the fore, and then followed in a train, Zwingli, Calvin, Oikolum, Padius, and many others, why were they so focused on this truth that God brings us into an eternally right relationship with himself through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone? Listen to these words of John Calvin. Wherever the knowledge that God justifies sinners by faith alone is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished, religion abolished, the church destroyed, and the hope of salvation utterly overthrown. Wherever the knowledge of salvation through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone is taken away, notice this, the glory of Christ is extinguished. Religion is abolished, the church destroyed, and the hope of salvation utterly overthrown. You need always to keep in the forefront of your minds that the great concern of the Protestant Reformation was not you and not me, but the glory of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It's interesting that for Calvin, our salvation is the fourth tier of his concern. When we annul, remove, take away the great truth that God justifies us, accepts us as righteous in his sight through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Yes, the hope of salvation is destroyed, but there are three more important things. Prior to that, the glory of Christ is extinguished. Religion as a whole is abolished and the church destroyed. So with that in mind, I'd like to think with you through these verses, or at least in some part of them, in Romans 3, especially 21 through 26. This is perhaps, as someone has put it, the greatest and most significant paragraph ever written. Five times in these verses, Paul tells us that God's salvation in his son, Jesus Christ, comes to us by faith alone. He puts it most strikingly in verse 28. By what kind of law is our boasting excluded? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. We are justified, made right with God, solely and alone on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there are many things you and I need to know in life in general and in the Christian life in particular. But there is one thing we all of us absolutely and desperately need to know. How can I be brought into an eternally right and saving relationship with a holy God? Well, God tells us himself in these verses. Let me first of all just set the context of what Paul writes here uh, in the wake of what he has just written in chapters 1, 2 and the first half of chapter 3. Paul has been from verse 18 of chapter 1 in particular showing us our desperate need of justifying righteousness. He has shown us that both Jew and Gentile together, the covenant privileged people of God, with all their riches and history and heritage and blessings, no less than the ungodly Gentile world, are before God in desperate pressing need 
of his righteousness. It comes to something of a climax in uh, verse 9 of chapter 3 where Paul says, as it is written, and he's quoting a number of Psalms, none is righteous, no, not one. That's an astonishing statement. No, not one. God holds the whole world, verse 19, accountable to him. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. And we're all under God's law. God's covenant people, most obviously to them, he gave the law in its written form. And by law, we mustn't simply understand the, the ten precepts, the ten words of God, the commandments, but the whole conspectus of God's revelation he gave to the Jews. But no less to the Gentiles did God give his law. It was written on their hearts. They did not have the written revelation of God that their eyes could see and that their ears could hear. But God in creation had written, chapter 2, if we had time we could look into that. God had written his law upon their hearts. Every man and woman in this world knows that God is knows there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. They may choose and do choose to suppress that truth and unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18 to 20. Because truth is uncomfortable. When you acknowledge truth, you come under its domain. You're no longer free in your conscience to do as you please. You realize there is something higher than you and holier than you. God has brought the whole world accountable to him. And in verse 23, he says, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the human condition. Whether men and women like to hear it or not, this is the divine assessment. This is God's x-ray analysis of each and every heart. All have sinned. We fall short of the glory of God. And it's into that condition that Paul writes, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. What Paul is doing from this point on in verse 21 of chapter 3 is to set before us God's holy, gracious, merciful, loving, kind, generous, sacrificial response to our undoneness and lostness before him. We were helpless, as we saw last night, to do anything about our condition. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But what we were powerless and helpless to do, God has done. But now God has revealed his righteousness. God has come. And has in person invaded the fallenness, the lostness, the darkness, the hopelessness of our human condition. And he has done so in grace. The manifestation or the revealing of God's righteousness, the righteousness of God, is God's glorious and gracious response to the darkness and despair of our condition. He did not leave us to languish helplessly and hopelessly in our darkness and lostness. 
he revealed his righteousness. But what is this righteousness of God that is revealed? What is it? Now, the righteousness of God uh, means different things in different places in the Bible. In the Old Testament scriptures, for example, in Isaiah uh, 51, uh, verses 5 and 6, we read some verses, some words that help clarify for us the relationship of God's righteousness to salvation. Verse 5 of Isaiah 51, my righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out. My salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Now, what is God saying there about his righteousness? He's telling us that his righteousness is his internal integrity. God's righteousness is his faithfulness to himself and to his purposes. We might say God's righteousness is his rightness. And we saw in Isaiah 51 that that righteousness is intimately connected to his covenant commitment to his people. Because he is the righteous God, he will come in salvation to his people. And this is precisely what Paul is telling us here in his righteousness, in his inmost inner integrity of being. God has found a way, a just and a righteous way to justify the ungodly. He has done so consonantly in harmony with who he is. He has not acted unrighteously, but righteously and justly. Look how he puts it in verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The cross of Jesus Christ was the most righteous act in the history of humanity. It was the most righteous act because God in delivering up his son, using the sinful acts of men sinlessly, in delivering up his son, God was acting in righteous harmony with who he is. He will by no means clear the guilty. Who is Jesus Christ? He was the guilty one standing in place of his people. God is righteous and holy. He doesn't condemn the righteous but the unrighteous. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why Octavius Winslow put it memorably, I think, when he said, who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not the Jews for envy, not Pilate for fear, but the Father for love. And if we simply look at the cross and shake our head and say what wickedness, what evil, what vileness, and all of that is true, if that's all we can say, We've missed the glory of what God was doing righteously in his son, Jesus Christ, to justify the ungodly. And so Paul says, but now, that is to say, in this new era of redemptive history, in the coming of God's own son, Jesus Christ, God has manifested his righteousness in Jesus Christ. God's righteousness, his internal integrity, his covenant faithfulness to his people has been fully and perfectly revealed. And what do we discover? 
we discover that the righteousness of God is a righteousness that provides justification for judgment deserving sinners through the sin bearing death and perfect obedience of his son Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ, the sin atoning death, the substitutionary penal atonement of Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the righteousness of God. It's significant, isn't it, that in Jeremiah 23, the promised Messiah is called the Lord, our righteousness. Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the righteousness of God. And that's why Paul can write in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that God has made known his wisdom to us in Jesus Christ, even his righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Jesus Christ is our righteousness before God. So what is the gospel? It is the free and the full forgiveness of all our sins. That's breathtaking, isn't it? Do you ever sit and ponder, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to his cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. But if that's all the gospel were, we would all of us be lost. Why? You know, you know why. This is where I want to ask someone to stand up and tell me. Because our great need before God is not that he deals justly and mercifully with all our sin, but that he also at the same time provides us with a judgment-proof righteousness. We need not only the full and the free pardon of all our iniquities. We need a righteousness that God can embrace and that God can receive and that God can welcome into his holy heaven. There is a city closed at its gates to sin, not that defileth, not that defileth can ever enter in. We need a righteousness. And God has provided that righteousness in his son, Jesus Christ. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And so the big question is, how do I get into Jesus Christ, the Lord, our righteousness? He is the righteousness of God. He is the one who in his own body on the tree made atonement for sin. He's lived the one sinless, perfect life that God can receive and accept in heaven. He is the only man who has merited anything from God. You know those great words in Philippians 2, 8 and 9, isn't it? He was obedient unto death, even the death of a cross, the sin-bearing, curse-enduring death of a cross. Therefore, therefore, because of his obedience, therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place. He is the only man who has merited anything from God. And we need to get into Jesus Christ. Five times in these verses... 22, 25, 26, then again in 28 and 30. Paul tells us how we get into Jesus Christ, the revelation of the righteousness of God. We get into Christ by faith alone. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation through faith in his blood to be received by 
faith. The end of verse 26, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And again in verses 28 and 30. But that then raises the question, what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? What is this faith that brings me into Jesus Christ, the Lord, our righteousness? Paul is big on prepositions. I once preached a sermon on Greek prepositions, not realising that every face before me was glazing over by the time I got to epi with the accusative. But Paul is big on prepositions. And almost always he will speak of believing into Jesus Christ. Sometimes he speaks about believing on Jesus Christ resting the weight of all that we are in him. But most often, he uses the preposition that signifies faith takes you into Jesus Christ. What is this faith that takes us into Jesus Christ? And that the reformers were so jealous to, to guard and to declare at the risk of their very lives. Well, let me first of all say, but it's not. Faith in Jesus Christ is not mere notional assent to truth. It's not simply acknowledging and assenting with your head that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, the head of the elect, the bride of the church. Faith is not merely assent to truth. The devil believes but trembles says the letter of James. At its heart, faith, and the reformers use this word, this Latin word, fiducia, faith is essentially trust. Believing in Jesus is self-abandoning, self-renouncing trust in who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Faith is personal. No one can believe for you. Faith is relational. It takes you into Jesus Christ. It joins you to Christ. Remember Joel spoke about that on Sunday morning. Faith links us to Christ. It makes us bone of his bone and flesh of our flesh. It brings us into his body of which he is the head. It unites us so that the very life of Christ, think of John 15, the vine and the branches, the life of Christ becomes our life. Faith unites us to Christ. It's personal, it's relational, and it is self-renouncing. Nothing in my hands I bring. Faith sees that its only hope lies outside of itself, and in Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Have you ever noticed in Luke 23, in Luke's lengthy narrative description of the passion of Christ, that five times he underlines the sinlessness of Jesus from the mouths of different people. Pilate, Herod, even the centurion, surely this was the Son of God. The thief on the cross, why is Luke doing that? Because he, he wants us to see that what's going on here is that the righteous one is where he is, not because of any unrighteousness in him. He is where he is because of the covenantal appointment of God for the sake of others. You see, faith isn't a matter of screwing up trust within you Faith is looking out to Jesus Christ. The reformers use these two little Latin words all the time, extra nos, outside of ourselves. They were always saying, don't look in. You won't find any comfort looking in. Scrabbling about, you say, oh, well, but 
Are we not to test and examine ourselves? 2 Corinthians 13, yes. But in the context in which Paul writes it, you need to understand that. Looking into yourself, excluded from Jesus Christ, is the most depressive experience a Christian can have. What is there in you? Paul says, oh wretched man that I am. You won't find any come. You say, well, I, I, I see this morning love to the Saviour. Well, that's good. What about tomorrow? What about next week when your heart is cold? When your circumstances are all against you? And Satan comes and says, look at you, how cold your heart is. How feeble your love is. How inconsistent your obedience is. How can you be truly united to Jesus Christ? What is our response? Well, let me look in a little bit more to find something that I can maybe bring to leave it against the accusations of hell. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Faith looks out. It is extra nos. It doesn't look in. It looks out to Jesus Christ. Now let me pause for a moment to say this. This is very important. It's not faith that justifies you before God. It's not even faith in Jesus Christ that justifies you before God. It's Jesus Christ who justifies you. And faith is the empty hand that receives the justification because it receives Jesus Christ. This isn't playing with words. Paul and the whole New Testament never once says that we are justified on account of faith. Never, never once. The preposition. Remember I said Paul's prepositions? Very important. We're always justified through faith. Faith is the instrumental means. We are justified by his blood, Romans 5.10. It is Jesus Christ who is the Lord our righteousness. He is our justifying righteousness. And faith receives him. I don't think anyone has put it more beautifully than John Calvin in the first few sentences of book three of the Institutes where he says, Christ comes to us clothed in his gospel. You know what he's saying? You can't separate the benefits of Christ from the person of Christ. God doesn't give you justification. He gives you Jesus Christ, our justifying righteousness. A couple of years ago, a very close ministerial friend of mine uh, phoned me and said, "I'd, I'd like to send you a sermon of, my assistant, he, he, he preached on repentance and I'd like to know what you thought about it. And I wrote back and said, you should never preach about repentance. You're thinking, well, he's going to say something else, isn't he? <laughs> and then I said, and you should never preach about justification. And you should never preach about sanctification. You preach Jesus Christ, our justifying righteousness. You preach Jesus Christ, our sanctifying righteousness. You preach Jesus Christ, the one towards whom we are to repent. And again, this isn't playing with words. This is understanding the, the, not only the language of the New Testament, but the theological texture of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the gospel. And when we tell people, you know, you need to be saved, we need to be thinking, how can I tell them that that really means you need to be joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour? Salvation isn't a thing. That's Romanism. God's scooping out of a treasury of merits and blessing you with this and blessing you with that. That's not the gospel. That's not biblical Christianity. We need ever to remember that Jesus Christ himself is the gospel. Some years ago in Cambridge, I did an address to the, to the children and 
um, I asked a question, and you know what children are like, and they put their hand up. And the answer, Jesus. Now, for a child, Jesus is the answer for everything. And the whole congregation laughed, and I thought, I'm going to go on a little tour here. I said, that's a brilliant answer. Jesus Christ is the answer to every question in the cosmos. Now, I was in a bright in congregation, so after the service, one of our bright students came up and said, eh, did you really mean that? Jesus Christ is the answer to every question in the cosmos. Biophysics, metaphysics, biochemistry, flower arranging. I said, yes. And he smiled and he said, so Jesus is the answer. Two and two equals Jesus? I said, absolutely. He is the logos to theu, the, the word of God, the rationality that holds the cosmos in existence. You cannot think a rational thought, but that Jesus Christ, the sustainer and rationality of the cosmos, gives you that to think. He is the omega point. All things were made by him and for him. Jesus is the answer to everything. That's what the great minds of this world don't get. It's what Einstein didn't get. It's what Stephen Hawking didn't get. Fourth, briefly, why is it faith that brings to us the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ? What's so special about faith? Why not love? Paul says love is greater than faith and now abides these three, faith, hope and love. The greatest of these is love. Why, why faith and not love? For this simple reason, faith by its very nature has no constructive energy. Faith is complete reliance on another. Faith is Christ-directed, not self-directed. Faith is Christ-reliant, not self-reliant. Faith involves the abandoning of self, not the congratulating of self. Faith kills all human boasting, verse 27. Faith draws everything from Christ and contributes nothing to Christ. Faith is a receptor. It is not a contributor. That's why it's faith. And we can never say, look at me, I believed. <coughs> because all God will say, what did you have that you did not first receive? Faith was the gift I gave you. We believe. Absolutely, God doesn't believe for us. But the faith with which we believe is the purchase grace gift of God from the blood of Jesus Christ. And lastly, why is faith alone so important? The Church of Rome teaches justification by faith. It does actually. It teaches salvation by grace. I hope you know that. The Roman church isn't Pelagian, it's semi-Pelagian. Alone, does one little word matter? It matters for two reasons, and I'll close with this. First, if we contribute anything, however small, to our right standing before God, we have something to boast about. The little word alone safeguards the sufficiency and perfection of the Lord Jesus' saving work. It stands sentinel over the glory that alone belongs to God. That's why the reformers were so jealous for that little word alone. And when that little word alone is absent, the gospel is lost. To quote Calvin again, the glory of Christ is extinguished, religion abolished, the church destroyed, and the hope of salvation utterly overthrown. That's the first reason why alone is so vital. And now the second, and I'll close with this. Christian believers also need to know this and believe this. Ed and I were talking briefly at uh, breakfast this morning, and he said to me, you know, maybe it's the older I get, but don't we as Christians need regularly to hear the gospel? Absolutely we do. It's a bottomless deep. And we need to be reminded 
day after day after day of these great truths because we can so easily drift into thinking that God accepts us because we pray, we read our Bibles, we witness, we preach, we write, we go to good churches, we're elders in a consistory, we confess the faith. Our hope before God rests on nothing else but the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. Maybe you're thinking, well, Ian, that's, that's well enough good. But where do good and God-commanded works feature? When faith unites you to Jesus Christ, it unites you to the man who went about doing good. By their fruit you will know them, said Jesus. Luther said, faith is a busy little thing. Faith is living. It unites you to Jesus Christ, the living Saviour. And there are two aspects to that. We don't have time to unpack them. The two aspects are simply this, that when faith unites you to Jesus Christ and you receive the salvation of God every day, you say, Lord, what would you have me to do? If you love me, keep my commandments. But secondly, and actually more basic than that, there is this. Faith unites you to Jesus Christ and his life becomes your life. And his was a life of unyielding obedience to his heavenly father. That doesn't mean we won't struggle, we won't fail, we won't fall, we won't lament. But I hope this is true of you, that if your inmost being could be spiritually dissected, there would be running throughout the course of your humanity this pulse beat. Oh, to love him better, serve him better, obey him better. Oh, to run in the way of all his commandments. That's what Rome doesn't understand. It said to the reformers, you're leaving people to believe in Jesus and then live any way they please. And Calvin said, what a monstrosity. You cannot be united to Jesus Christ and not live by his grace a sanctified life. Let us pray. Lord, we bless you that we are united to your Son, not because of any deserving in us, not because of any desiring by us, but by faith that you grant to us in your grace. Help us ever to look out to him and to resist the temptation ever to look into ourselves. Help us to glory in the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us. And we pray in his name. Amen.